Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we begin with a sped up version of the Cassei rocket launch just because I wanted to see it launch in real time instead of with the physics lag. And so this is sped up by about a factor of two is what it took to get it to go in real time. And yeah, I just felt like doing that for once. And we are bringing up some more xenon gas and more methane and oxygen and it'll visit the Mars Transit Vehicle number two first and then it'll visit the supply vessel. I still haven't come up with a name for either one. I've thought of names, many names in fact, I just can't decide between them. So I'm just being indecisive here as far as picking a name. So. And uh, I don't know if I want a particular naming convention or whether I should just do a one-off. It's a long story. So I'm just being indecisive about the whole thing. Anyway, right now we're in 1.3 times acceleration and soon will be just regular time. And there goes the core stage, the fairing separation. And so we're on this hydrolock stage producing about 4,000 kilonewtons. So still a fairly sizable stage though it's difficult to tell that very easily. I don't know if there's some way of adding visual cues to models so that a person could tell how big they are, well, you know, short of actually drawing a figure on the side or a banana for scale of course. But uh, yeah, I uh, the problem is broadly shared by all the rocket models that I've seen so I don't think there's any easy way around it. We have seen this process before as we boost our orbit up to the level of Mars Transfer Vehicle number two. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, what we're really trying to do in this episode is finally get crew to Mars Transfer Vehicle 2 in its high orbit and then have them head out. Yes, it is that time. By the end of the episode, I want to have crew heading out to interplanetary space. Uh, heading out to Mars is a little bit more of a complicated business because we still have to do a few burns for that one. Uh, so I'll just reveal that right away. But here, uh, this vessel is docking with MTV2, which I guess is what it'll be called for the time being. And, well, things really don't want to dock with MTV2 these days, to be honest. I brought that in pretty darn gently, and the docking ports are all oriented well. Not that it matters, actually, uh, but... I just bump and it's just not quite doing it. It's very frustrating. And then it does something weird, which I, that, I don't understand what the heck happened there. The colliders on the docking ports are pretty tight, so there shouldn't be any question of them doing anything weird. Same with the tugs. Um, I was worried about that solar panel, but we managed to keep it okay. Not that, it doesn't actually matter, to be honest. That's more aesthetic, uh, it's not a permanent fixture and actually we could lose that solar panel and the thing could still do everything that it was meant to do. But finally I managed to dock the darn thing and deliver the fuel. So that leaves the MTV2 completely topped off and I wanted to move this along to the supply vessel to deliver what we could there. And that was an easy transfer, no problems. So the bulk of the time I took uh, for this episode was actually cycling these out further, getting to a higher orbit. It takes a long time with these ion engines, even though I can use time warp with the ion engines, it's, it's tough. And also I have discovered an additional problem. I can't really do the ion engine burns for both vehicles at the same time, and to a large extent, on the way to Mars, we're going to be burning for quite a big chunk of it. And that's problem number one. And problem number two is that the water recycler on Mars Transit Vehicle 2 only works when we're focused on the vessel. So if we're busy doing a burn with the supply vessel instead, doing an ion engine burn of multiple weeks, that's going to cause problems for the water supply on Mars Transit Vehicle 2. It's not going to be critical actually because I supplied it with more water than it needs. But we'll have to keep an eye on that. For this time but in general I think it would be better if we do not have two different ion engine ships going on the same window so that's something I had a vision of you know fleets of these things but that's not practical in Kerbal Space Program now somebody has suggested uh, with these 
spent stages to slam them into the moon. But in that case, we actually had enough Delta V to bring its orbit down to uh, crash into Earth, or, well, burn up in Earth's atmosphere. So that's what I did. Anyway. Uh, so here I am continuing the cycling process. Now, if we could have both ships in render range of each other, then we could do both burns at the same time. But of course, that's not only difficult, but also potentially extremely laggy. So, yeah, I didn't fancy that coordination. Initially, I wanted the two ships to rendezvous in high orbit and have the Kerbals go from one to the other in order to grab that docking port on the supply ship that's uh, sort of left over. But I decided to just skip that. That was needlessly complicated and I just want to get on with things. So we are going to cycle out the supply vessel to a very high orbit, but we need to keep MTV2 a little bit more restrained because we still have to deliver our crew to it. So you can see it's, it's still boosting out though. And uh, initially I boosted it up to those orbits that you see there. And of course all of this took a lot of in-game time as well. So instead of time warping to the transfer window, I didn't do that at all. I spent the entire time doing these ion engine burns. And ultimately, because the orbital period is so high, we uh, we eventually got to the window just doing the ion engine burns. So you can see uh, we got a moon encounter that I didn't really want. And that meant that the supply vessel had to spend more time burning. This isn't strictly efficient, but it doesn't matter really. I just wanted to avoid that moon encounter complicating things. I think it still managed to complicate things because we kept burning like that though. It's uh, effectively a radial burn. So it actually increased the amount of delta V that we would take to exit. And still here, I decided to bring it up a little bit more. I think it's on a five day orbit there. And you can see the relationship of the orbit to the magnetosphere and, you know, our radiation exposure. So basically, it's going to be swinging by real fast through that magnetopause area. Anyway, here we are with our first crew of Mars Transfer Vehicle 2, the first bunch of Kerbonauts that will be sent out to Mars. And they are Sigber, Jamie, Jed, Jedcast, and Rib Van Kerman. So, yeah. There we are. <laughs> it's two pilots, an engineer, and a scientist is what we have. And we'll see how they do. You note that I didn't decide to risk any of the the original four. So yeah. <laughs> Just in case. This is the Sujita Super Heavy, of course, and I sped up the launch of it as well. A uh, factor of 1.9 on this one. But now, with the boosters off, we can go in regular old physics lag time. And escape tower jettison. So after this, after getting the crew out to interplanetary space, in the next episode we have to get the supply vessel out. And then we'll begin launching the quicker missions, you know, the non-ion missions, uh, out to Mars. And that'll include a quest module for the Mars station. Uh, so that they can actually do EVAs and such, that they need an airlock, uh, a Mars tug, a uh, Mars lander, a uh, pack rat rover uh, for Mars. Maybe we'll also send one for, well, they probably don't need it for Phobos and Deimos. That actually, it probably won't even work on Phobos and Deimos. So. But a pack rat rover for uh, Mars. Uh, if you don't know what a pack rat rover is, it uh, is one of the USI mods. I think it was in the survival pack or something like that. Anyway, um, we'll try another ISR unit and then uh, surface space modules. So all that business has to be sent over. So once again, the whole bunch of launches. Here we go for mid-course adjustment. Now initially I wasn't going to have this Lynx spacecraft join Mars Trans Vehicle 2 on its trip to Mars. I was going to have it deorbit itself uncrewed. Uh, but it turned out that it wasn't going to have enough fuel for that on its own. So either I was going to add fuel to it and have it do that, or I was going to just leave it with Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. And I ultimately decided that it did provide one additional abort option. And that's a particular situation where uh, if Mars Transfer Vehicle 2 could not recapture into orbit around Earth, 
Um, we wouldn't have to do some really insane rescue mission. We could just have the crew get into the Lynx spacecraft and deorbit with it. As long as we locked the remaining fuel in this, that should be enough to get them back down. So if Mars Transit Vehicle 2 was not able to capture into Earth orbit on the way back, it would be a possibility. The downside, of course, is that we have to take this 10 tons. Oh, uh, it'll end up being like a little bit more than 10 tons all the way out to Mars and back. So possibly the reason why Mars Trans Vehicle 2 is not able to recapture into Earth orbit is because we brought this along. So yeah, it's, it's a tough call. Ultimately, I decided that we would bring it along, but we are getting pretty heavy, to be honest. And there's a lot of dry mass involved, and this is basically going to be another bunch of dry mass. It looks like about 12 tons worth. So we've got the lander, we've got all the modules for them to live in, the quest airlock, the supplies. That's a lot. And then all the solar panels that we technically don't need anymore because we've got the nuclear reactor. The big solar panels will probably be replaced by radiators down the road. We still need to trust to do like artificial gravity, which I will not have started up yet at the end of this episode. But yeah, this is getting pretty heavy. And also those docking ports don't technically match, but they're both NASA docking ports, so they should dock. But initially I had some problem, but I've been having trouble docking to this thing the whole time. Magnetism just doesn't work anymore on the Mars transfer vehicle. Not at all. So here I'm trying to get it together. But yeah, you can see there's just nothing going on between those docking ports at all. But I back way. Initially I was worried that because they were different models it wouldn't work. But this time when I approached, it did dock. So yep, I guess when they're both NASA docking ports they work. I transferred all the Kerbals into the big inflatable habitat, the Bigelow 330. And they will spend their time in there. That should be fully shielded this time around. It was only half shielded last time. That's one of the differences between MTV1 and MTV2. And here we are turning for an ion engine burn. Checking on the crew, they had 1% stress and 1% radiation, which I guess is pretty good. We can see a good amount of food and then seven years of water. Uh, obviously way too much, but again, that's because of the water recycler and I decided to check that out. And so turning off the water recycler, we see that it goes down to 300 days only. So without the water recycler, we definitely do not have enough, but with it, we do. And here we go with the ion engines again. Now this is still like 27 days before the transfer burn out, but I decided that we needed some time to make sure that the crew actually gets here. And after all, if it's in such a high orbit, it's a little bit tough to get to. Ultimately, after a few passes, it was time to actually do the burn to exit. And we got the encounter with the moon as sort of expected. So it was time to light the methane oxygen engines such as we have them on the tugs right the tugs are our high power engines i guess you could say but you can see how much acceleration they give us it's not much even with physical time warp it's painful really <laughs> but and we can't time warp with them they are light that's the good part i suppose but this could do with a more powerful engine to be sure but there it is, accelerating. And ultimately it is effective. Here we are on a pseudo escape trajectory right now. It's not really, really an escape trajectory yet. Uh, still passing by the moon there. We will ultimately have a moon flyby, but a very loose one. So somebody had asked what the differences between MTV2 and MTV1 were. And one main thing is that we're carrying an extra methane oxygen tank. Basically, we've got double the methane oxygen capacity that we had on MTB-1. So that gives us some. And uh, we also have the additional shielding on the B-330. And now we're carrying a Lynx spacecraft. 
we have the nuclear reactor so I don't have to worry about the orientation of the solar panels constantly and also we don't really have to worry about the electric charge going down right because the nuclear reactor will provide a continuous supply regardless of our orientation so that'll ease some time warping though again we'll have to do most of the time warping with the focus on MTV2 otherwise the water recycler probably won't work so anyway we got to an escape trajectory, finally, and I checked how much we had left of delta V. First on the methane oxygen system, we have about 1,300 meters per second out of, I think we started out with 1,500, so we didn't use a whole lot of that yet. I don't know if it was a good idea to stop this burn right now, um, and now thinking about it, I would probably have kept the methane oxygen system going for a bit longer. And you can see the replot there. That's assuming a burn in interplanetary orbit trying to get to Mars. We still don't have a Mars encounter yet. We just have a way out to interplanetary space. So with the xenon gas, assuming we don't do any more burning with the methane oxygen, we've got 5,000 or so meters per second. So it's not great. And yeah, I think we should have burned off some more of that methane oxygen, but... It's tough to say because I know that the capture burn around Mars has got to be 900 or so, 800 to 900. And we could pretend that we're going to use just the methane oxygen for that. That means that we'll only have 400 left after that. So it's tough to say. Anyway, I noticed that the crew got 3% stress. And I was a little bit worried about whether they would be good on the stress factor on the trip. It's a long trip. And if they're already at 3% stress, that's a little bit, you know, concerning. And they have a lot more room now. They were only at 1% stress when they arrived at the Mars Transfer Vehicle. But now with all this extra room, they've got to 3% stress after being here for less than a month. Uh, the mission's, you know, more than 24 months. So more like 30 months. So by that time, we're talking about 90% stress? I don't know. So, Yeah. I was concerned about that, but we are out. We are in interplanetary space. You can see from our apoapsis and periapsis. And so one way or another, they are on their way. If they all go crazy, let's hope they don't rip everything apart. Uh, even if they can't control the vessel, we've got, um, you know, remote controllability. So <laughs> I'm already planning for them to go insane. Anyway, uh, this is what has happened. And next time... We will proceed with the supply vessel and other Mars launches. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.